Now, I want to thank, uh, thank you all for uh, being here and uh, listening to something different that you may not have uh, heard before. You know, when you, uh, you've been working in Washington, D.C. all these years, you see certain trends. Uh, trends go up, trends go down, and uh, you begin to put in, put thing, putting things together that ordinarily you wouldn't be if, uh, if you're just there for a year or two. And what I've seen is, first of all, massive number of muckraking books coming out in this country, exposing almost everything. They expose the military-industrial complex. They expose big pharma. They expose the chemical industry, the coal industry. They expose the oil industry, the banks, the insurance companies. They're coming out so fast, I can't even keep track of them. And the more that come out, the less effect there is on what they're trying to change. I'm not saying there's a causation. I'm just saying that the, the ground is not fertile. We don't have the people we had in Congress 35, 40 years ago. Uh, there's nobody who can compare with Senator Warren Magnuson on consumer legislation, for example. And we don't have uh, <clears throat> the labor union strength that we had then. Uh, we don't have uh, the ability to uh, express our hope that the press will cover us on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the press has gone into Pulitzer Prize winning features. They like to do a major feature themselves rather than cover citizen groups' struggles on Capitol Hill uh, to get something through that relates to the subject of the feature. And when they, the uh, legislators know that the press is not watching them the way Drew Pearson watched them and, and uh, Martin Mintz, the Washington Post, watched them, uh, they don't feel the heat. They just have to write out one page one feature. And of course, uh, we have a situation where uh, uh, public TV and uh, public radio have become increasingly cautious. Uh, they raise money from corporations as well as small contributions. Uh, and uh, they're more frightened of reactionaries in Congress than they are progressives because reactionaries know how to turn the screws and have no compunction uh, about it. We have also the massive uh, learning process by corporations who have uh, learned how to game systems, how to delay better than ever through their corporate law firms, how to uh, fund both parties now. It used to be that labor would fund more of the Democrats and business the Republicans. Now the Democrats dial for the same commercial dollars. So although we live in a golden age of uh, documentaries, that's another uh, a situation where we have great documentaries coming out. Look how many great documentaries came out on the Iraq criminal war of aggression in Iraq. Virtually nothing. Even members of Congress who deigned to watch them. Nothing. So what's happening to us? Why is it that one of the assumptions of a democratic society, that is, if people are informed, they will act accordingly? Why, what's going on here? Uh, we have access to more Im information. If we don't like what's in the Seattle papers, we just go on the computer and, or we listen to Amy Goodman or we read the progressive populist or uh, we go to any number of blogs. So there's, there's no more excuse as to not having the news right away. Uh, uh, even if we don't like the U.S. news, we can log into foreign uh, websites and programs. What's happening to us? The first is uh, disclosure does not have its own imperative. It's not enough. It doesn't come close to being enough. Becoming aware doesn't mean we're going to act. Be being concerned doesn't mean we're going to be serious. Because when it comes down to it is the following. Why are 553, why, why are 535 men and women in Congress, senators and representatives, who put their shoes on every day, the way you and I do, captives, for the most part, a majority of them, by 1,500 corporations who have no votes? 
they have money, but your senator and rep senators and representatives don't get there except for votes. Money they like because they can put ads on and try to intimidate their opponents and make themselves look good. But we're the only ones that have the votes. So why is this artificial entity called the giant corporation, why, why does it have this kind of influence? Because it has other kind of power. It has the power to plan our futures. And it is overwhelmingly planning our political future, our elections future, our environmental future, our genetic future, our commercialization of childhood future. It's planning more than any other entity, our military future that I know of. A good deal of our foreign policy planning. It's planning our trade future, certainly, NAFTA, WTO. It's moving to plan our educational future. Corporatization of universities is well underway. And uh, look what they're doing at the elementary and high school level with commercially managed charter schools. Not charter schools, commercially managed charter schools with multiple choice tests that are not really the way to assess a child's intelligence, a child's multiple intelligence. There's no one definition. So what, what's happening to us? Well, first of all, human beings are capable of incredible self-deception. <clears throat> we all have to fight that. We're very vulnerable to myths because some of them we want to believe. And just because they're fictional, why not keep believing them? And one of the myths is that we live in a democracy. Wh what does it mean to live in a democracy? Well, it means a certain level of freedom and justice. Well, let's take Marcus Cicero's definition of freedom. Over 2,000 years ago, he defined freedom as participation in power. Have you ever heard a better definition? By that yardstick, how much freedom do you have? Here in Seattle, state of Washington, the great Northwest, the USA, how much freedom do we have in in any way, directly or indirectly, influence Bush and Cheney in their criminal, military, and foreign policies? How much freedom do we have in shaping this grotesque tax system that taxes things first that we like, but doesn't tax things first that we don't like, like carbon tax, Wall Street derivative speculation, corporate crime? Sodas, maybe. <laughs> How much freedom do we have uh, in a thing that matters that's beyond our household? Well, some of it's a little bit here and there. How much freedom did you have in <clears throat> deciding whether your stadiums are going to be built by tax money or not? Do you think Paul Allen had more freedom than all of you combined? <laughs> he actually did something which no one I, I've ever heard do in the United States. He actually bought an election day. Can you imagine that? He told the legislature, don't worry, I'll pay for all the precinct expenses. Let's have an election day in June. And then he proceeded to pump the money in, and people here were pretty skeptical. You know, the polls always show people don't want tax-funded stadiums for the sports owner billionaires. We beat it in Connecticut when the Patriots cut a deal from Boston to come to Hartford for a $550 million stadium and another $50 million for a practice field. You know, it's like a dessert. <laughs> and we, we got fairly good cooperation with the media, and, and we turned the tide. It was 3-1 to one for the stadium, and we turned it in four months. And I came up here to do the same thing here. It was close. And... There wasn't any press around. I, it, was, it was almost like Mississippi North. And there was absolutely no, no TV, no radio, no, no uh, newspapers at all. Just before the election, the referendum. Some of you may remember it. So Paul, Paul Allen had more freedom to participate in the power that led to that tax-funded stadium 
than all the people in Washington State combined. So what about justice? Well, you know, justice is the great work of human beings on earth, said Senator Daniel Webster many decades ago. And look at, look at what we're up to now. And to have justice, you have to have expectation levels. <clears throat> if you don't raise your expectation levels for what we expect to come out of our government, what workers should have is their just desserts from a large G G GDP economy, modern economy. Uh, why should they give it to us? Why shouldn't they concentrate wealth in the top 1% and have that 1% have equal wealth to the bottom 95% of people? How's that for a ratio? Why should they have the, the CEOs be paid four to 500 times the entry level wage in their business, like Walmart? When I was a kid, it was 12 to 13 times the CEOs paid. We didn't think they were underpaid then. Now it's over 400 times. The head of Walmart makes about $11,000 an hour, eight hours a day. Before noon, before he takes his first lunch break on January 2, he's earned more than any one of a million Walmart workers over the entire year. So why should they, why should they give us the just fruits of our labors? Because why should they worry? So here's what we've got to do. The first step in a democracy is to spend time on it. If you don't spend time as a routine in showing up at city council meetings, voting for things you think are important, putting initiatives on the ballot, showing up in courts once in a while, uh, showing up in marches and demonstrations, and so many of you here tonight know what I mean. You call people up who agree with you and you beg them to show up. You tell them half a democracy is showing up and they agree with you and they have the same grievance and they, the same complaints and they're too busy and they're too preoccupied. And about a month later you say, you know, you didn't show up that meeting, uh, you didn't show up that march on something you're really concerned about because you were too busy. Could you please tell me what you were too busy with? Um, you can't remember? Um, what are we so preoccupied for that we don't have time for democracy? So the first thing is time. Any tyrant who thinks <clears throat> that there's a movement, a democratic movement in their, in their country, all they have to do is ask one question. How much time are people spending on it? If they're into their private lives, if they're into their rationale of their own futility, if they have a hundred excuses for not showing up, for things they really care about, why should the tyrant be concerned? Now look at Bush Cheney, two tyrannical draft dodgers that loved the Vietnam War but wanted others to die for it. Uh, they were in the White House and uh, they had a predetermination to invade Iraq with a few neoconservatives, most of whom we're draft dodgers too. How do we ever get a country that took us into a military invasion in violation of federal statutes, the Geneva Conventions, and the US Constitution? It was never declared by the Congress. Led by draft dodgers. I mean, wh where is our red-blooded Americanism, if I may coin a phrase? You'd think they'd lose some credibility, wouldn't you? But they didn't have to worry about us because all they did was start pounding the lies through the mass media, which rolled over, with few exceptions, about weapons of mass destruction being tied to Al-Qaeda, threatening their neighbors, uh, threatening the U.S. with drone planes, and so on, and uh, <clears throat> being in connection with 9-11, Ch Cheney pushed that along, the media rolled over. Well, how about our Democratic Party in Congress? They rolled over too. So he had two potential opponents rolling over. And this is before the soldiers started going over when, when 
the country is silenced, of course. So who is left? There are about 300 former generals, retired generals, admirals, former heads of uh, national security agencies, CIA, uh, people from the uh, Department of State, the Pentagon. They're all retired. They all worked under Republican or Democrat administrations. People like General Zinni, retired Marine uh, specialist in the Middle East, Admiral Shanahan, former head of the Pacific Fleet, uh, Bill Odom, four-star general and head of the National Security Agency, uh, and on and on. They spoke out against the war in the six months beforehand, including Brent Scowcroft, who is the chief security advisor to the first George Bush, George W.'s father, and also Jim Baker, former Secretary of State, very close to George Bush's father. So they all spoke out. Some of them wrote, wrote op-eds in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. They would uh, put out a statement. Some of them testified. And then they went back home. At the same time, we have a mega billionaire, George Soros, in New York City and Long Island. He had lived in Hungary under fascism and communism and come here as a young man, very, very rich, makes three, two billion dollars a year routinely. He's a brilliant financier. He spoke out against the war. Uh, he had writings against the war. He's very incisive. He has comparative historical experience. He knows the signs when the drums are being beaten. He spoke out against the war. He gave interviews against the war. There's one thing he didn't do. He didn't put 150 to 200 million dollars behind those 300 retired military, diplomatic, and security people to get them on TV and radio and newspapers day after day. Repetition is important in those six months to expose the lies and falsehoods and deceptions of the Bush Cheney regime. They would have informed the American people that the U.S. Army was against the war up to the four-star general level, but were muzzled. They would have been more likely to be invited to Congress. We would have had perhaps thorough congressional hearings because Congress can't really resist people who are on the national media day after day. He didn't do that. I called him in that period and didn't get the call returned. He's hard to reach. But you know, I don't know anybody who made that connection, that potential connection. Justice requires money. Peace requires money. We know war requires money. But 150 to 200 million dollars for George Soros was nothing. He just made 3.7 billion last year. Billion. And he didn't think of it. He didn't think of it because brilliant as he is, incisive in knowing how to build democratic institutions as he is, the starter of the Open Society Institute, he didn't have that requisite imagination. And so it does start with imagination. And we have to keep repeating that word again and again, because if we don't imagine, we won't envision. If we don't envision, we won't raise our expectation levels as to what is possible and very, very achievable and overdue for our society and our country's impact on the wor world. We have the lowest expectation level of any people in the Western world. Let's face it the lowest expectation level of any people in the Western world. After World War II, we were the Colossus, the USA. No number two. After World War II, Western Europe was devastated, cities blown up, impoverished, people walking with one leg, 50% unemployment, countryside destitute, They pulled themselves together, a little help from the Marshall Plan. 
And they demanded through their multi-party system and through their trade unions, they were stronger than here, and through, through their cooperatives, stronger than here. Here's what they demanded and got for all their people. We have none of that for all our people, 65 years later. They got demanded and got universal health insurance for everybody. Nobody dies today in Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, Italy, Austria, Sweden, Norway, Netherlands, because they don't have health insurance. In this country, 45,000 Americans die every year because they don't have health insurance to get treated or diagnosed. Harvard Medical School research paper, peer-reviewed, December 2009, Journal of Public Health. That's 800 a week. They demanded and got paid daycare, paid maternity leave, and paid family sick leave, including grandparents. For all the people, we have none of that. They built decent public transit. Do we have that? They gave students university tuition free. Do we have that? The minimum paid vacation, regardless of whether you're in a union or not, four weeks, seven weeks in, student, in Sweden. Shall we go on? That's what I mean about expectation levels. And we're passing these uh, sign-ups for those to stay in touch so we can work together. And if you'd like my month, weekly column, I can send that to you uh, online by the way, it's being, uh, being passed around. So why did I write my first work of fiction? First of all, if I did it nonfiction, nobody would believe me. <laughs> this came out in nine, I did this in nine, equivalent of nine months. But we reflected 40 years of uh, <clears throat> indignation and frustration. I'm really tired of our society paralyzed, stuck in traffic, can't, con can't confront any problem that's documented a thousand times, whether it's housing, hunger, poverty, whether it's public transit, whether it's cutting down that military budget to a decent size, whether it's going after corporate crime and the looting of trillions of dollars of pension money and mutual fund money. I mean, how long, how long do we have to remain frustrated like this? There's a huge consensus in this country. Once you get down to the specifics and you're not in the abstract ideological world where people can control us so much more easily, when you come down to specifics, liberals and conservatives want clean food, they want safe pharmaceuticals, they want their cars recalled. I haven't met a conservative yet who says to Toyota, don't you dare recall my car and fix it. There's a consensus here. 81% of the Americans in a recent poll think America isn't going in the wrong direction. 75% believe that corporations have too much control over their lives. And 61% believe both major parties are failing. That's a pretty good consensus. And when the Green Party puts people on the ballot with an agenda, you look at that agenda, and most of it is a majoritarian agenda. And the Green Party ends up with a fraction of the vote. There's a two-party system, it is a tyranny, it's rigged from the electoral college all the way to exclusion from debates. It's as if uh, we ration debates. I wish we would ration some other things, but we don't ration. Why should we ration debates? And why should we have a debate commission that's created by the two parties so that they can keep off everyone who challenges them? And therefore, you can't reach tens of millions of people. So let's not kid ourselves. This is not a democratic society. To the extent that we have civil rights and civil liberties, we're lunching off the past, increasingly the remote past. Increasingly, we're taking these births of human rights that were installed in <coughs> constitutions and previous laws and we're using them less and less, defending them less and less, 
allowing corporations to use them against us because they've been given equal constitutional rights with us. And so the process is atrophying. To what extent in the last 60 years have we remodeled, renewed, updated, and invigorated our democratic procedures? We're still using stuff that's 200 years ago. And we're letting the corporations use it against us. Since when did the tobacco company's commercial speech earn constitutional protection? Since when has tobacco industry's promotions trying to hook 12 years old, 12 year olds into a lifetime of smoking with a one out of three chance of dying from it, getting constitutional protection? That's what I mean by using it right against us. So I decided to write this book and let me put the thesis of the book to you. Suppose someone said to you, there are 17 super rich Americans in their 70s, 80s, and 90s who are very upset and concerned about the downward drift of the nation in many ways. And they don't want to leave this country in this state. And they're willing to raise and contribute $15 billion and go to the grassroots of our country, every congressional district, every state, neighborhoods, communities, all kinds of service clubs, thousands of lecturers every day, 400 recruiters, a clean elections party, a people's chamber of commerce. They're willing to buy an, an entire sub-economy in order to put forward sustainable practices and combat the forthcoming counterattack by the corporate giants who get wind of what they're doing to turn the country around. How would you advise them? Someone said, Here, here's what it is. 17 of them, you know quite a few of them. They're Warren Buffett, they're William Gates Sr., they're Ted Turner, they're Yoko Ono, they're Bill Cosby, Paul Newman, they're uh, other people you may not know. Uh, there's Ross Perot, uh, Joe Jamail, uh, Peter Lewis. Uh, anyway, they're all very rich. They all have the Rolodex, they all have the circles, they all have experience on how business operates, they know the warts, they know the underbellies of these business giants. And um, uh, they're ready to go, they want to do it in one year. One year, you say? Yes, one year. They want to have the power collision, they want to have the people recover their sovereignty, recapture the Congress, have their own mass media, develop clean elections, uh, install all kinds of worker, consumer, small taxpayer organizations, develop community economics, more credit unions, more community energy, community food, more community health clinics in order to uh, become more self-reliant and undermine the power of uh, the big drug companies and hospital companies and agribusiness companies and energy companies and so on. Uh, so, you got, a, you got a couple months to figure it out. How would you advise them to proceed? That's what I asked myself. <clears throat> 700 pages. <laughs> the detail in this book is to show it can be done once you accept the premise of a tiny, 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 tiny number of older, enlightened, Super rich people, none of them are angels. That's one reason that why they were so effective. So on the ground. And they're willing to put 15 billion in and leave some behind for future years. And they're willing to basically say to all these grassroots institutions, all these achievements, see you later. It's yours now. You got no one to blame but yourself. So how would you advise them? Well, if you want one person's take, that's what this book's about. Leslie Stahl read this of CBS, 60 Minutes, and she wrote me a letter saying she found it engrossing, creative, and funny. And I said, I'll take all three, given the size of the book. Now, the book 
develops the kind of strategies and tactics, the speed of confrontation and collision with the mounting counterattack by the corporate bosses and their Washington allies that I think are very realistic. It is the amazing when you're dealing with a fiction that could be nonfiction, you tend to urge things you would never urge because the people would say, that takes money. The people would say, that takes organizers who have to be paid. It takes media, which you're not going to get. So once you take those out of the equation and you say, yes, there is money. There is money for organizers. There is money for buying sub-economies. There is money for a people's chamber of commerce. There is money for a mass network of TV and radio stations. There is money for people who are lecturing and conversing with as many as one million people a day personally. Once you deal with that, all kinds of strategies and tactics that we have repressed because, quote, they can't be funded. It's unrealistic of you. Become practical. And there's a point in this book which Warren Buffett turns to his assistant. They fly back and forth from a mountaintop hotel in Maui. That's where they cloistered themselves to plan every month. He says, you know, we've done all this on less than one-third of my net worth. Less than one-third of my net worth. Just like George Soros for $150, $200 million. Why are we not holding these people up to their appropriate civic responsibilities and financial capability? Since for the most part, they agree that our country needs redirection. We're not talking about 99% of the super rich. We're talking about a few nationally and more but still very few locally. And some of them will be mega billionaires, some of them will be multimillionaires. Some of them can do something for localities, some of them can do something for the nation, some of them can shift power in a very fundamental way. There has never been a social justice movement that has not been preceded by a demand by the powerless to shift power from the few to the many. So they, they have a lot of uh, pressure, a lot of tension in here. You'll uh, finish this book, I hope, feeling stronger as a, as a citizen. Whatever discouragement you had might be less. Whatever cynicism you have possessed might be receding. And you might say to yourself, why haven't we talked with these people? Why haven't we talked to these people? They often let us know where they stand. We're talking about the tiny, tiny minority now of these super rich. How many do we need? 150 million bucks to 200 million could have stopped the Iraq war. Trillion dollars wasted, lives in Iraq, a million people dying, blown country, contaminated, destroyed, uh, riven with sectarian conflicts because the invader sided with one against the other and passed out $100 bills and divide and rule. Look what's happened to our soldiers. They've been brutalized. The ones that have come back alive have been brutalized. And often their families have felt the brunt of that, post-traumatic syndrome. And we haven't yet begun to pay for the veterans and their ailments. 150, 200 million dollars. Where's our imagination? Where's our sense of going to someone like George Soros and say, You've thought of a lot of things that have made you rich. You've thought of a lot of things of starting citizen institutions. You put your money behind it. You just may not have thought about this. What about bringing these 300 together? You get your calls returned. Let's take prison reform. You know how much money is pushing behind Senator Jim Webb's proposal to establish a commission to study prisons and all their horrors and wastes and commercialization and brutalization and recidivism. You know how much money is behind 
his effort just to do a study commission? Virtually nothing. You don't think there's a mega millionaire in this country who would like to reform our prison system? Sure there is, but people aren't going to these people. They're not putting it on the table in front of them. These super rich people are amateurs like all of us. They don't really know how to make change, but they have a lot of change. <laughs> and once they start thinking about it, and once we start thinking about it, once our expectation level goes up, suddenly we find ourselves very creative in how to make change because we have the resources for it. The abolition movement against slavery, you will recall from our history, was funded in no small part by rich, proper Bostonians and some New Yorkers, including people who helped fund Frederick Douglass, whose immortal phrase, power concedes nothing without a demand, ought to be memorized by every school child in the country. We often forget that the modern civil rights movement was significantly funded by rich families. The Curry family in Virginia, the Stern family in New Orleans. Somebody had to pay for organizers, for litigation, all the way to the Supreme Court. Somebody had to help pay for transportation, for rent. It's expensive. Nowhere near as expensive as the forces arrayed against them, but one dollar behind a form of justice that reflects public sentiment can counteract $100 from the other side. As Lincoln said, with public sentiment, we can do anything. And without it, we can do very little. And I, my contention in this book, and there's a lot of dialogue here, in this book you see how the mounting groundswell that was heading toward the East Coast, began to confront conservative thinking and conservatives. And I think you'll be intrigued by the interaction and what happened uh, as a result. There is a story like this in most of you. I suspect that most of you have been engaged in civic activity of one kind or another. May I see the hands? Okay. I suspect some of you have not won all the time. And when you lose a battle, whether it's initiative or the stadium fight or whatever, you've got to get rid of this top two nonsense here if you want dissent to be reflected in the political system. You lose a battle what goes through your mind quickly? Oh, if we only had more media. Oh, if we only had more people on the ground, canvassing, leafleting, organizing. Oh, if we only had more money. If those are the questions that go through your mind, you've got a story like the one in this book. Maybe localized maybe even more instructive. This is not a novel. It has never been conceived as a novel. It will never be read as a novel. And it will never be remembered as a novel, I hope. This is a work of political imagination we're all capable of from our own experience. And I hope it generates a new genre of fictional writing that could become nonfiction by raising our imagination to envision and our expectation level, along with our morale. I read, uh, when I was a child, teenager, I read a book called Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy. Some of you may have read that. That was the spectacularly famous uh, utopian novel. That was a novel. Uh, by a Bostonian that came out in 1886. And it helped fuel the populist progressive movement because it posited a United States of America more than a century in the future where there was no poverty, there was 
prosperity, justice, and so on. And it excited people because it gave them a scenario. Everybody knew it was fiction, but it gave them a scenario because it was explained in understandable terms on, on how they ordered the society. Year 2000, actually. The writer should have extended it another century, probably. And uh, Eugene Debs used to quote it. You know that it sold a million copies in hardback. It was one of the best sellers of all time to, to date, to that date. And people would talk about it in bars. They would, it was incredible what it did. Looking, how many read Looking Backward, Edward Bellamy? Yeah, I, mean, I didn't find it the most exciting book. But then I'm reading it in 1940. Five, uh, 1950. I, I'm not reading it then when you look back you, you, and, and at that period in the Industrial Revolution and the dungeon factories and all the turmoil and the struggle of workers. The interesting thing about Eugene Debs, who was a great man. I think he was one of the greatest men in American history. He's a... He, he, he uh, spoke out against World War I, which was one of the most preventable wars, and Woodrow Wilson's attorney general threw him in jail. In jail, he got a million votes running for president. I mean, that's like three million today. He's the kind of man who could take a train from Baltimore to Chicago to make a speech in a field. 200,000 people show up. So, obviously, he, he was an indefatigable campaigner for the working people of the country. Where there were mass strikes, where there were general strikes, he was there, Eugene Debs. And near the end of his career, a reporter asked him, what's your greatest regret? And he looked at the reporter and he said, my greatest regret? My greatest regret is that under our Constitution, the American people can have almost anything they want but it just seems like they don't want much of anything at all. How would you like to be that reporter? Get an answer like that. That's our problem today. We are misled, underled, and we're lied to. We now are confronting a phenomena that can be encapsulated in one word in Washington, D.C. Obama Bush. His military and foreign policy. Is, it, it's, it's nothing we looked forward to. We all wanted him to succeed. Some of us knew that he had a serious character deficiency of being conflict averse. He does not like to challenge power, and he doesn't facilitate the engagement into power of people who supported him. Some of you may have heard of Dr. Quentin Young. He's 85 years old. He was one of the founders of the National Physicians for Healthcare, single payer. He's a good friend of Barack Obama's. Taught him a lot about organized medicine and hospitals and health insurance. They had many a dinner together. Barack Obama becomes president. As far as Barack Obama is concerned, Quentin Young doesn't exist. He was never invited to the White House for one of the dozens of meetings that were attended to on invitation of the White House to discuss health care and health insurance reform. Obama invited the head of Aetna six times, personal meeting, the CEO of Pfizer Drug Company, six times, personal meeting, Quentin Young, Zero. That's what I mean by a character deficiency. Barack Obama, before he became a politician, by his own words, believed in single-payer health insurance. Full Medicare for all, everybody in, nobody out, free choice of doctor and hospital, and much more efficient. In foreign and military affairs, when you have a personality and a character like Obama, you are not going to take on 
what Eisenhower warned us about in his farewell address, the military-industrial complex. You're not going to reverse a foreign policy of empire. You're going to expand the war in Afghanistan and say you're going to get out of Iraq. How can you say you're going to get out of Iraq and not be called a peacenik by the warmongers, soft on terror? You expand the war in Afghanistan. The war in Afghanistan and now into Pakistan will never be won. It will just fade away after endless destruction and deaths and injuries, mostly on their side. The Taliban will probably, in all its diversity, continue pressing for negotiations with Karzai. We'll continue trying to have bases there. There'll be continual toil, turmoil. We'll have our drones there, where people in Nevada, nine to five and five to one, you know, it's an eight-hour job. They push buttons and blow up people, most of them civilians, including wedding parties. This is being done in our name. Are we entitled to be angry? Are we entitled to be ashamed of ourselves? Are we entitled to break our routine? Are we entitled to stop making excuses about people not being powerful? Aren't we entitled to start putting some muscle behind we the people in the preamble to the Constitution? The last time I remembered, it wasn't we the corporation. Can we continue to make excuses for ourselves? Can we deny that if two million people in this country decided to make the end of these criminal wars their principal civic hobby, they could stop them? That's what it would take. You just try it. Spread throughout the congressional districts. Most of the people in, Cong in the Democrats in Congress want to end those wars, and more than a few Republicans. But who, who surrounds them every day? Lockheed lobbyists. Neocons, Yahoo's on cable TV, Rush Limbo types, draft dodger Rush Limbo types, PACs, political action committees, contractors, Blackwater, Halliburton, the corporate law firms represented them, the PR firms represented them. Where are we? We're voting for American Idol. Where are we? Where are the people? Two million organized people can do it. Who's going to organize them? When I was a kid, my father would t pose questions to us, and one of them was, why throughout history have the few dominated the many? His answer, the few are organized, the many are not. We outnumber them. We outvote them and we can subordinate them to the informed will of the people. The problem is individual biology. The problem is because we are not more than one person, it's easy to say, what can one person do? It's not like we are congealed one million people, and when we eat, it goes through all our capillaries, and if the brain says go, a million people go, no, there's a million people composed of one million separate biologies. And those separate biologies have grown up in a corporate culture that has made them brilliant in rationalizing their own futility. And you've seen it in a hundred different ways in your own experience. I finally reduced it to four excuses, but you can probably add. Why didn't you turn out? Here are the excuses. Why didn't you turn out for things you believe in? Okay, nobody's trying to get you to cut your teeth on some mission that uh, you disagree with or don't know anything about. Why didn't you turn out? One, 
I'm too busy, I don't have the time. Oh, okay. Let's say you're not too busy and you do have the time. Excuse number two. Excuse number two is I just don't understand how to do it. This jargon, it's parliamentary procedures, these lawyers throw stuff at us. And I just don't know how to negotiate the system. Okay? Let's say you have the time, you know how to negotiate the system. What's your third excuse? Third excuse is, I don't want to be slandered, and I'm afraid of retaliation at work if what I do is something the boss doesn't like. Oh, okay. Well, let's say you have the time, you know how to negotiate, you, you're not blistered by moonbeams, and you don't think you're going to be retaliated at work. What's your fourth excuse? Fourth excuse is the closure. Fourth excuse is, even if I had the time, even if I knew what to negotiate, even if I didn't fear retaliation, it wouldn't make any difference anyway because they will decide. They will decide the power structure. And then they go back and live their private lives, ever more under pressure. And when they become 70 and 80, they look back and they wonder why they missed the justice train. That's what we have to caution young people about. There's a tremendous vacuum of dissatisfaction if you've just gone through life getting a good standard of living and getting your leisure and your recreation and the job you have and not standing up for what is quite widely portrayed as a deteriorating planet, a deteriorating nation, and a deteriorating community even though the McMansions and others keep going up. So someone once asked me, what's the biggest problem in this country? I said, insufficient amount of civic motivation. If we're not civically motivated, we just live our private lives, and the civic and political arena become harsher, crueler, more vicious, more destructive, and it begins to spill over into lessening the quality of our private lives. So that's why I called one of my groups that I started, Public Citizen. It comes from ancient Athens, where people got up in the morning and they improved ancient Athens. They were called Public Citizens. And we need more Public Citizens. We need more people, and I urge you to communicate this to others, we need more people to say to themselves, I'm going to spend an average of five hours a week on my civic pursuits. It doesn't have to be five hours every week, but that's roughly what it would be. Now, how many of you have met serious bird watchers? Can I see the hands? You know what a serious bird watcher is like, right? Up at dawn, into the marshes, binoculars, phones, gloves, pads, pencils. Ah, got one. Now, what if we had serious Congress watchers? <laughs> There's a story in here about this. Uh, what if we had serious Congress watchers? I mean, let's say someone knocks on your door and says, hi, I'm your new neighbor, just want to introduce myself. I spend 22% of your income, can let corporations rip you off and endanger your health and safety and that of your family, raise or lower your taxes, and send your children off to wars. Uh, Nice to make your acquaintance. See you later. <laughs> what would you say? Hey, come back here. You mean something to me. So I better mean something to you. You could say something else. You could stand there at the doorway and say, why you? You interrupted me. I was updating my profile on Facebook. <laughs> okay? So, so, how much time do we spend on Congress? Let me tell you how to turn Congress around. It is so easy to strengthen the people in this country into a deliberative democracy if people had the civic motivation to spend their time and their talent and their sense of fairness and justice. It's so easy. We have so many solutions on the shelf. 
We have energy solutions, housing solutions, food safety, nutrition solutions for our children especially. We have solutions about uh, how to deal with uh, fossil fuels, occupational disease, medical malpractice, you name it. They're all there. How to turn an inner city school into a thriving exercise of curiosity and inquiry and learning. We know we have them on the shelf, some of them pilot projects, but we don't have a diffusion mechanism. That's one big thing we're lacking. We have a best practice here, best practice there, but we have a diffusion mechanism. So let's say, okay, here's how to turn Congress around. It's in here, by the way. Let's say 2,000 people in every congressional district. That's about 900,000 people. Every congressional district has 630 or 650,000 people, men, women, children. Every congressional district, 435 of them. Let's say 2,000 people, and by the way, every congressional district but six has a college, university, or community college, or all of them. So let's say 2,000 people. It starts out with 10 people. They get together in a living room. Imagine a living room. How about that farmhouse in 1846 in upstate New York when six women started the women's suffrage movement? Ah, they must have been dreaming. Ah, what hubris, what arrogance. It happened. Just like Rosa Parks in 1955 in, in Montgomery, Alabama, was sitting in the front of the bus, and a white man came and said to her, and she said, I'm just too tired, sir. I'm staying put. They called the police, handcuffed her, took her off to jail, ignited the Montgomery bus boycott, and helped launch the modern civil rights movement. How many black people in Montgomery, Alabama, knew what Rosa Parks knew? Every one of them. By the way, a 15-year-old girl preceded her and refused to go to the back of the bus. But she didn't get the fame. Everyone did. So what makes Rosa Park different? She had fire in her belly. Without fire in your belly, it doesn't matter what you know. You're not going to break your routine and take that risk for justice. That's true for the sit-down workers in Flint, Michigan, Warren, Michigan, in the 1930s in the GM plants. They put their entire family livelihood on the line. There was no unemployment compensation. In the Depression, not likely any job, because they wanted the dignity of forming United Auto Workers for a decent workplace and, and pay. Fire in their belly. Where's the fire in our belly? You've got fire in your belly. You wouldn't be here tonight. It's a nice day. The sun is out over Seattle. But do you know how many people don't have fire in their belly who agree with you? It's like pulling teeth to get them out. That's what we have to overcome. That's not done by email so much. That's done by personal con conversation. That's done in living rooms. That's done person to person, persons to persons, more persons to persons. So let's say it starts out with 10 people in a congressional district. Then it goes to 20. Then you lay out the 2,000 person scenario. Each person pledges 200 volunteer hours a year. Each person pledges to raise or contribute $200 a year. Okay. This money will open up two or three full-time offices in the district with full-time advocates, and you develop a pre-agreed upon agenda, let's say single payer, living wage, etc. So there's minimal bickering down the line. You agree on a platform, and then you match the fervor of serious bird watchers. And watch what happens to your member of Congress, who up to now has very little to worry about you. 
as long as they flatter you, fool you, flummox you, as long as they gerrymander districts so they don't have to worry about the opposing party, it's either slam dunk Republican, slam dunk Democrat. That's the majority of congressional districts. As long as 95% of them get reelected every two years, automatically, why should they worry about you? They worry about the auto dealers here, they worry about the insurance agents, they worry about uh, the restaurant lobby. Why should they worry about you? You're not organized. And year after year, your interests are subordinated and atrophied and repudiated and overcome. And before you know it, you become cynical. You say pox on both your houses. Half of you don't even bother to vote. And the rest trudge to the polls either as hereditary voters or voting for least worst of the two. Year after year, that's the death knell of any pretense of democratic elections, small d. Now, what's 2,000 people? I know bowling leagues in, pres in, in congressional districts bigger than that. I know Mahjong clubs together are bigger than that. I know bridge clubs bigger than that. You see, we don't grow up this way. We don't grow up civic. Our schools do not teach civic skills. They teach computer skills and computer skills and more computer skills so we can have millions of young people spending half their waking lives looking at screens. And if they don't look at computer screens, they're looking at TV screens or they're looking at video game screens or they're looking at this little gadget. I think if there's ever a, a statue of the early 21st century young American, it will be walking like this. <laughs> eh? So, I hope you read this book. I hope it motivates you. I hope you write your own similar story of political imagination. And I hope you start getting 10, 20, 30, 40. We turn Congress around, that's the beginning of the rise. Congress is the most powerful branch of government, even though it surrenders it to the presidency and to the courts. It doesn't want the responsibility that Madison and Jefferson gave it. But if it ever gets restored, you turn Congress around, it has the appropriations power and the tax power and the health and safety power and the declaration of war power. I mean, there's nothing compared to the Congress of the other branches. You turn the government around, it starts affecting the state governments, local governments, other people get ideas and they realize, you know, it's pretty much fun and it's pretty much gratifying to restore the sovereignty of the people. And you hand something to your children and your grandchildren that you're proud of. I mean, what is more humiliating than 30, 40 years from now with these deteriorating trends? Your young grandchild, age 9 and 10, sitting on your, on your knee, and you're the grandparent. And, you know, they're just at the level of awareness where they see this world is in trouble. And they ask the most straightforward questions. Replace the White House Pest Corps and put 10-year-olds in there, and you'll get a better result. <laughs> they ask very straightforward questions. And so this little girl, this little boy is looking at you and sitting on your knee, says, Grandma, Grandpa, what were you doing when this, all this started crumbling? What are you going to tell them? A lot of people are going to have an empty taste in their mouth, if not a sour taste. I think it's, it's very sad to go through life without pursuing a more just society and a more just world. I think that, that can be the ultimate gratification outside of family. When you think of how great talents are trivialized in this country, brilliant lawyers trivialized with derivatives and mergers and acquisitions that don't do anything for our economy other than make a few people rich, how brilliant chemists are put to work by food companies to develop the latest prize for a chemical whip on a bakery product, 
actual case? When the most brilliant physicists are producing weapons of mass destruction, which has now been announced last week by our government, will be able to kill anybody in the world in one hour with precision? How brilliant biologists were put to work under government contract, working in universities, creating more virulent forms of dengue fever before Nixon put an end to biological research, warfare research in the country? And right now, how many young people will go into the, into the commercial world and be fairly well paid, but after they retire, they can look back and they say, oh, I guess my talents were trivialized. They weren't used for noble ends, for solving the great important problems of the world. Commercially, corporations are not addressing the great problems in the world. They're spending far more of their efforts creating them or intensifying them. The tobacco industry, chemical industry, coal industry, oil industry, drug industry. Try looking at the drug industry without government research and development. Three quarters of the anti-cancer drugs are developed with your tax dollars, given away free to the drug companies out of National Institutes of Health. The biotech industry, the semiconductor industry, the aerospace industry, the containerization industry wouldn't be anywhere near where they are today without your tax cut dollars and government research and development, trillions of dollars over the last 50 years. The great problems of the world will be done by civic efforts, political initiatives, in a democratic fashion, whether it's abolishing poverty or dealing with housing or dealing with preservation of our biosphere and the environment, you name it. It is not going to be done through the commercial world. The commercial world may adapt to it, may obey it, may reap its benefits, may distribute it, but it's not going to be generated, with very few exceptions, from the commercial world. I urge you, if you buy two copies of this, give it as gifts. It's a great Mother's Day gift. <laughs> you get this one free. This is by a remarkable CPA, who is quite elderly now, and he did the, the most elaborate social accounting of corporate profits and corporate losses by taking in, into account all the damage to the environment and the fraud and cranking it in to a comprehensive accounting of a corporate performance. And he shows the damage is greater than the benefit. But the damage creates more demand, like making more people sick because of pollution creates more demand and more jobs for health care, for hospitals, for doctors, for ambulances. His name is Ralph Estes, and his last work is a book on how to begin to challenge and hold accountable corporations. It's extremely specific. It's like a toolkit, and you get this free if you have two of these. Now, you might wonder why you haven't seen me on Bill Moyers. Diane Rehm, Terry Gross, Charlie Rose, public radio, public TV. What's wrong? I, I ask you to answer that. These public TV and public radio, the nationals, are so intimidated by right-wingers in Congress, from which they get their meager budget, and are so solicitous of corporate donations. They're putting more right-wingers on who would like to destroy public radio and public TV than the people who defended them in the hard times of past years. And I say this because there are a lot of other people who are being kept off public TV and radio, whose names you know and who, whose authors have been here, of a progressive bent and just as a side request, I hope that you will send your protests and your demands that these people appear more often, like Bob Kuntner, Bill, uh, Bill Greider, Jim Hightower, uh, Gloria Steinem, and others. And if they don't hear from you, uh, the intimidation of the right wing will continue, and we will indeed find that the slogan public broadcast system 
has been transformed into the petroleum broadcast system, which is the nickname in Washington. Last point, and then we can have a very good, good discussion, I hope. I, I thank you for your, uh, your patience. I hope that you'll work on the schools, the elementary and high schools, to get them to adopt civic skill courses. I'm not talking about traditional civics with dull textbooks that are so dull that when you read them, it's like swallowing a pound of dust without butter. <laughs> and we all know what that means. They're afraid of controversy, afraid of proper names, very sanitized. That you will encourage uh, teachers, and if they have any role in that, principals, superintendents, boards of education, to install civic skill courses starting in the elementary school. We have idealistic students. They're wonderfully curious. They will respond to connecting the classroom with their community. The laboratory for civics is the community. It's full of challenges, problems, and intriguing intellectual searches, whether it's the supermarket, whether it's the local factory or office building, whether it's the use of energy, whether it's town hall, whether it's the tax system, whether it's a waste dump that fifth grade students Salt Lake City in a class one day heard one of their classmates say, there's a waste dump three blocks away and it's covered with shrubbery and bushes. And they all said, what? And the teacher said, what? And to make a long story short, she turned it into a class project. Indeed, it was a waste dump. They held a news conference. They met the mayor, the city council. They cleaned up the waste dump. The kids then testified for a Superfund law before the state legislature. And she got so excited as a teacher, she wrote a little book called kids in social action and how to do it. And she just came out with an update. So if we do not rescue this young generation from the electronic gadgetry that has turned into a narcotic and an addiction, if we don't rescue them from 10, year, 10 years of age spending seven and a half hours a day, seven days a week looking at screens according to a new survey. If we don't get them into reality, into their neighborhood, conversing, exchanging, learning about the history of the community, and developing the civic tools from the Freedom of Information Act to how to build a coalition, to how to get inf information out of City Hall, to how to diffuse voting records, to how to become resilient, to how to share credit, to how not to get discouraged, to how to make your last defeat your best teacher, going through the, the ages with more sophistication. We're going to lose this generation beyond our wildest nightmares. They're being raised by corporations, fed by corporations, entertained by corporations, manipulated by corporations, defrauded by corporations, and rendered ignorant by commercial values predominantly crushing the civic values that we all treasure for our future and our posterity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.